good afternoon, good morning. Thank you for, to everyone for joining us um, from around the world. And thank you so much to our amazing friends at Marie Claire UK for hosting this panel with us. Today is an extra special day for Mothers to Mothers. It's World AIDS Day, a day for us all to take stock of the amazing achievements that we have had in the fight against HIV AIDS, but also a moment to reflect about how far we still have to go. We've all experienced this year what it is like to fear a virus. With the outbreak of COVID-19, we've seen how much it's changed our lives. The fact that we're not all here together um, for this panel that is, is long planned is, is a testament to that. At Mothers to Mothers, we've been tackling another pandemic for the last 19 years. HIV AIDS, which has had and continues to have a devastating and enduring impact on the lives of millions of women, children and families across sub-Saharan Africa. As some of you know, one of my favourite quotes is by Nelson Mandela. He said, I have discovered the secret that after climbing a great hill, one only finds that there are many more hills to climb. And at Mothers to Mothers, we already knew we had many hills to climb to truly meeting the global goal of ending HIV AIDS and of ensuring health for all by 2030. But boy, has a new mountain sprouted up this year. With COVID-19 making life even harder for the over 1 million women, children and families we work with across 10 countries in sub-Saharan Africa. According to the UN AIDS report published today, there were an estimated 150,000 new HIV infections among children last year, and the vast majority of those were through mother to child transmission. That's compared to a 2020 target of only 20,000 new infections. Around half of the children living with HIV globally are on antiretroviral treatment they need and deserve, but that compares to over two thirds of adults that are on treatment. We have so far to go. Our discussion today is about role models and that forms the basis of the organisation which I am so proud to be part of, Mothers to Mothers. And this is where the good news comes in. M2M knows from two decades of working to end HIV how important peer support and role modelling are to creating healthy, thriving communities. The young women we employ as peer mentors use their experiences of living with HIV and understanding their communities to educate and support girls to access vital health services, to make better choices for their health and take control of their future. Since we were founded in 2001, more than 11 million women and children under the age of two have been reached by our services, 11 million. Over 11,000 jobs have been created by Mothers to Mothers for HIV positive women. As we rebuild our world after this pandemic, we have a unique opportunity to shape a future that is truly inclusive and gender equal and ensure girls and young women can reach their full potential. This is where our She's Got the Power campaign comes in. We believe that the girls of today have the power to become the unstoppable women of tomorrow. And hopefully, if you're here with us today, you do too. I'm so looking forward to this uplifting conversation. Thank you once again to Marie Claire UK and the amazing panelists joining us today. Moderating the panel is Andrea Thompson, Editor-in-Chief at Marie Claire UK. Andrea began her career as a journalist working for an enormous range of publications including the Daily Mail, the Sunday Times, the Guardian, Channel 4, Glamour and Grazia before joining Marie Claire. Andrea has been a huge supporter of Mothers to Mothers and I'm so looking forward to hearing from her today. We have Sophie Williams, author of Anti-Racist Ally and the owner of the Instagram Millennial Black. Sophie's a leading anti-racism advocate and advocate activist. She's a regular panelist, speaker, consultant and workshop facilitator with a focus on anti-racism, diversity and inclusion. We also have Anna Matha, psychotherapist and author of the Sunday Times best-selling novel Mind Over Mother. 
Anna's passion for taking therapy out of the therapy room, empowering people to utilize simple techniques that will help reframe the way they think, has seen her regularly feature in publications including Grazia, Fabulous, Stylist, The Telegraph, Marie Claire, Psychologies and Red. Alongside being a mother to three kids, she's also had a hugely successful podcast and a wealth of experience. And finally, I'm delighted to introduce Nosy Samella, our Mothers to Mothers spokeswoman, who quite frankly needs her own YouTube channel. Nosy first became aware of Mothers to Mothers at just 19, when at six months pregnant, she received a diagnosis that she was HIV positive. Now, Nosy survived stigma and discrimination associated with HIV, ultimately delivering two HIV negative children and subsequently working for Mothers to Mothers as a frontline healthcare worker, a mental mother, a role she held for seven years. After this time, she transitioned to join M2M's communications team, where she now focuses on equipping mental mothers, working in clinics and communities throughout sub-Saharan Africa to tell their stories in support of M2M's mission. I'm so excited for this panel. I hope you are too. Thank you to all for joining us and over to you, Andrea. Thank you, Emma. What an introduction. Um, and welcome to everybody who's joined us today. I am, again, very excited to be chairing this panel, and uh, particularly as the topic of role models is something I feel so personal, personally passionate about uh, myself. As the editor of Marie Claire, I'm always conscious of the power of positive role models to motivate and inspire, whether it's reaching our career goals or staying positive during challenging times. Um, and this year is a perfect example with you know, such a, so many challenges that we've all been through. But here today, I'd like to start with asking Anna a little bit about the psychology of role models. What exactly makes for a good role model, Anna? And from a psychological point of view, do you think we really need them? Oh, no, me. There we go, that would help, wouldn't it? In an ideal world, wouldn't it be amazing if we grew up into families that had really strong role models? Because developmentally, we tend to look to parents to get an understanding of how we should navigate the challenges that, that we that we experience in life. And so often it is not the case. So as children, we find ourselves kind of scrabbling around for who do we look to? Where do we look to, to tell us how to make sense of the world around us and how to kind of make sense of the challenges that we find ourselves coming upon? And for so many people that those challenges come so young in life. And I remember in my, my childhood, we experienced kind of loss and trauma when I was a young child. And I looked to my mum, I looked to her to see how, how does she cope with this? What does she do? How does she speak to that person? How does she respond? And, and I think we, we need that, we need that kind of that reference point, that, that anchor to hold on to, to, to help us navigate these challenges. And we look for, Ideally, we look for kind of someone with that positive attitude, someone that chooses effort over perfection. So kind of someone that just embraces challenge, someone with humility to navigate the mistakes because we're all, you know, we're all human. And I think when we look to these role models that seem to, and we'll talk a bit more about this later, that seem to portray this perfection, it sets up this, this, this kind of, unachievable goal that is we find ourselves striving towards so it's really important to to think about what role models who are we looking towards who are we letting dictate and give give feedback in in our own lives and it's it's something that can be so instinctive but we really benefit from exploring it a little bit further who who are we looking towards who are we giving the power to speak into our lives who are we looking to for direction because we all we all look in various places and for some people it might be they might be able to identify one person whereas for someone else they might have had numerous people throughout life that they have looked to we learn through watching we learn, and this is, you know, right from childhood, we emulate things, we learn through seeing the behavior of people around us. 
And what we feed ourselves with, where we look to dictates so much of how we respond when we, when we go through times of challenge and times of change and what we consume and what we take on, it, it impacts the way, the lens that we see the world through. So it's really important to be exploring what makes a role model for us a little bit deeper. And when I often uh, interview successful women, they cite their mother or a favourite teacher. Are we more likely to be influenced by people as we when we're younger? Um, you know, at what point in our journeys are we most kind of susceptible to positive influences? I've, I often hear research around how just how important it is for teenagers in particular to have mm -hmm role models and teenage women when they are carving a career you know to see women in in positions of power yeah because it gives us something to aspire to doesn't it it's it's that aspiration and and I think it's really important to ask ourselves are we looking to that person to inspire us to be more ourselves or are we trying to be more like them you know and and it gives us it gives us hope when we see someone that's a few steps ahead of us be it an age or experience it gives us hope that there there is more that is attainable for us that there that there is more especially if in childhood we might have had people or teachers or you know people of influence in our lives tell us that we can't achieve things so actually having someone as a reference point that is that few stages ahead that is achieving something that we yearn for gives us gives us hope and can can empower us to kind of keep pushing through and keep moving through mm. i mean our cultural references and influences are so important sophie when you were growing up did you feel that there were any realistic models that you could aspire to really interesting because until we started sort of having this conversation I have never sort of recognized the role of role models I've never really recognized it as something that was missing from my life but no I don't think that there was anybody either an individual or a group of people who I looked to to model the things that I was doing I think I've always been a relatively independent person and I think I mean, I'm sure if I were able to go back now with more clarity, I could say actually that, that person had a big impact on me or this person did that for me. But I think um, what was said in the introduction about peer mentoring, I think actually really resonated with me. I think I've always looked to those around me and been very conscientious about building up those connections about who I allow into that sphere around me. And I think that to me has maybe been in place of role models because interestingly you both spoke about um, mothers and teachers and I think at the time when I was young they would have been female people and I think maybe and I've not done the research maybe we look to people who mirror ourselves in those spaces maybe maybe girls look to their mothers and um, I'm sure that Anna would be much more um, well positioned to speak to that than me um, but I think as potentially a black woman growing up in the UK, um, there weren't many people who reminded me publicly of myself. And so I think that sort of became something that I did myself in the communities that I formed. So you spoke a little bit about, you know, your previous career in advertising and really feeling that there wasn't anybody who was high profile in management who reflected you know anything back to you in terms of you know what sort of person you were and you know particularly as a black woman um, in the industry how do you think that impacted you personally and influenced your career choices and how your career has developed yeah so I mostly talk about that in reference to being a chief operating officer and noticing realizing probably having always understood that there wasn't anyone around me who was in a similarly senior position who looked like me in any way but the reason that that was notable wasn't because of what it did to me it's because of what it did to people's expectations of me so people would come to meetings where I would be hosting and running but they would presume that I was also going to be the person who was taking notes and the person who was fetching coffees because that's what people who looked like me were in the spaces doing and so I don't think it necessarily changed what I did for my career, but I think it made me more conscientious about one, trying to be visible for other people and two, trying to open up those pathways. Because again, I wasn't thinking of it in a role modeling capacity, but I was thinking, 
I have this unique experience. I am the only person who I know who's like me. How can I bring in more of these people at a junior level, at a senior level, at a peer level? How can I create spaces of opportunity for people like me? Because there's no reason for these groups to be underrepresented. It's just usually laziness on behalf of people who are in either a recruiting or retaining capacity. And so I didn't really think about it as, as what it meant above me, but what it meant that I could open up for people who might want to come into that space behind or alongside me. It's interesting because, you know, now in, in the last year, you, you, your, your, your profile has hugely increased um, and you now have a very, very significant profile on social media. How do you use your platform to be a positive role model to others and what are the challenges? I mean, you've spoken a little bit about making sure that you, you know, have, have a, um, give a lot of space for others um, to come up behind you and shining the light on other people. But are there actually challenges to being in, in that sort of high profile situation as a role model to so many other women? Yes. Yes, there are. And I think it helps me that I haven't thought about it in those terms. I haven't thought about it as I am a role model in that space. I've thought about it as I am someone who's doing work publicly and encouraging other people to do that same work. And the way that I try to navigate that is, um, as Anna was saying, by being vulnerable, by being human, by being accessible in that space, which isn't to say that I'm always available for people to take what they need when they need it but I do sort of have channels where people can communicate and I can try to sort of, you know, um, offer some kind of support or I can say, actually, I'm not the right person for this, but let me put you in touch with this person or this organization or that other thing. Um, but I, I made a decision about that really early on because my, it's really weird to be like, my Instagram's this, but it's 2020 and this is where we are and everything's gone wild. Um, but my Instagram is very sort of um, graphic led and I had to make a choice. Do I want to be a character in this? Do I want to exist in my own narrative or do I want to just be sort of the faceless, nameless um, pink and black squares of information? And I made a decision to be present in my story. And the hope there was that seeing somebody doing it, seeing somebody in that space, making mistakes and saying, oh, I did this wrong. Here's what I should have done. Here's what I wish I knew. Um, I'm hoping that sort of living in that way and modeling the behaviors that I've, I've never thought about it as role modeling, but it is, isn't it? Definitely is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Nosy, I wanted to bring to come on to you because you bring a whole fresh insight to the whole to the discussion. Um, having grown up in South Africa, um, mm. did you have any role models as a teenager, and what sort of values did they embody? And did people around you sort of have similar role models? Um, interestingly, I'm <clears throat> I'm much like Sophie that when I was growing up, um, I was not looking at any particular person to sort of inspire what I wanted to grow, to grow up to become. But I think looking back, I probably would say um, one of my English teachers maybe was my role model. Um, and it was just in the way she carried herself, the way she gave respect to each one of us, even though we're much younger than her and were her students. Um, and the way she was just always willing to sacrifice her time to ensure that we had a chance to succeed. Um, I think that growing up, especially growing up in South Africa, growing up in a township um, where we were not exposed to terms such as role models, I don't think any of my, of my peers actually really thought of role models. I mean, many of us didn't even know what that was, but growing up um, and after becoming or after being diagnosed with HIV, I suddenly had people who were mothers to mothers, mental mothers, people that I looked up to, people that I believed in, people that I wanted to be like, 
Um, so for me, things only changed, I guess, in my adulthood, um, as much as I was still young at 19, but I was also an adult and I could now see things and understand things a little differently. As, as Emma said, you were first introduced to mothers, to mothers as a 19 year old, you were pregnant and you were HIV positive. Can you tell us a little bit about your first encounter with Mothers to Mothers and the role that they played in your life in shaping it and how your future has, 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 has panned out as a result? Absolutely. So Andrea, um, when I was diagnosed with HIV back in 2005, um, what I understood about HIV was that it killed. I had seen it kill. I had seen it in my own family. I just, I just lost a cousin to AIDS related illnesses. So when I was diagnosed with HIV, the only thing that went through my mind was that I was going to die and that my baby was going to die. Um, and so on that very same day, when the nurse told me that she would take me to a room with, where I would see and meet other women living with HIV, I remember thinking I did not want to go there because in my mind, all I could imagine was a room filled with women who were sick with their sick babies and it just sounded depressing. I didn't want to go there. To my surprise, when we got there, I saw happy, healthy women, healthy babies. And for a moment, I did not believe it to be true. I thought we were lost. Um, and I was, I was um, positively shocked when one of the mentor mothers from Mothers to Mothers came up to me and told me that she too was living with HIV. Yes, it was hard to believe, but when she told me that it was possible for me to give birth to an HIV negative child, everything shifted. That is the only thing I wanted at that time to just give my child a chance to life. And of course, like I said, I didn't quite believe them because I believe I just thought maybe they were paid to tell us that they too are living with HIV. But the fact that they gave me hope, it did change, it did change my perspective. Um, it did make me believe that maybe there was a chance that I would survive my diagnosis. And I got courage to tell my family about my HIV status. Yes, the journey was not easy, but then ultimately giving birth to an HIV negative child, that made me stop for a moment and think that had I not met the mentor mothers on that day that I did, perhaps wouldn't, I wouldn't be here right now. Um, and perhaps my child, as I imagined, would have been born HIV positive as well. Wow, um, it's very such an incredible story. Um, what was it about the, men, the the kind of outlook and the attitude of the mothers to mothers staff that made them so relatable and approachable, given your situation? Because you know, given the fact that in South Africa there is still a stigma, isn't there, about HIV and AIDS, and um, it's quite difficult for a lot of communities to talk about. I think what made them relatable to me was that they truly understood what I was going through. They truly understood how difficult it is to be um, positive. And I mean, mentally positive at a time where, I mean, death surrounded us. Um, and what also made them relatable to me was the fact that they were women coming from the very same community as I was. So they were ordinary people who, were, who to me were doing something extraordinary. Um, so, and I think more than the mentor mothers, what also made me go back, keep, keep going back to mothers to mothers was actually going into the support groups and meeting other young women just like me who were walking the journey with me. And so we became this kind of sisterhood of, of women who were walking, you know, different journeys together, you know? Um, and yeah, 
I think that's, for me, that, that was just it. The fact that they were coming from the same communities as ours um, and the fact that they fully understood what I was going through, which is still true to this day. And yes, there was stigma towards people living with HIV then. There still is stigma today, even though it is greatly reduced. And this is why it is so important to have people living with HIV um, show up and show others who are newly diagnosed with HIV the way forward, just like the mothers to mothers, mental mothers are. And you are a mental mother of yourself now, aren't you? So you're a role model, a mentor to, to other women, which is just lovely, the full circle. Um, that must have been sort of quite a challenge in the beginning because it's not something that you were used to doing. You have to go around and do, do a lot of public speaking like this and um, standing up for the values of the organization and also inspiring and motivating and giving courage to that younger generation. How, how's that been? Correct. Um, when it started, I did not think of myself as a role model. I still sometimes don't think of myself as a role model. I just think of myself as an ordinary woman who's just doing what, who's just giving back to her community. Um, but then of course I am a role model and that comes with a sense of responsibility, um, responsibility towards my own health and ensuring that I keep myself healthy in order for those who look up to me to follow the example that I'm setting. And I think this is true for many of the um, mentor mothers that I work with, that most of us don't see of, don't think of ourselves as role models, but we're just giving back to our communities. And the fact that we get paid to do it is a bonus. <laughs> Why do you think it's so important for girls in South Africa to have um, role models right now? Do you think that they were previously looking in the wrong places? And I'll, I'll come on to this a little bit with the, with, the other, with the other panel members in a minute, because I do think that we can, as human beings, sometimes miss, you know, make mistakes about where we, we look for, for role models. Absolutely. I think it's, it's, it's critical for, for girls in South Africa to have role models. Um, I say this because I think, I think looking back, I think there's so many things that I would have done differently had I had somebody who I would, was looking up to, somebody who was modeling away for me, um, somebody who was paving, paving the way for me. Um, and I think that, you know, with girls facing so many challenges, peer pressure, um, the prospect, you know, the, we, we live in, 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 um, in a developing world where many girls come from poor families. And the fact that, you know, their background exposes them to even greater challenges, the challenge of, you know, maybe not getting to finish school, not getting to um, make positive decisions, um, challenges of, you know, getting into transactional um, relationships with older men, I think having positive role models is going to help them make healthier, mm. better, more positive decisions, and ultimately influence the kind of women that they're going to become tomorrow. Um, as Emma said, um, we believe that the young girls of today have the power to become the unstoppable women of tomorrow. Mm. Wonderful. Um, Anna, I want to talk, I just want to revisit that sort of sentiment of, of, of um, slightly negative role models and how people can sometimes chase the wrong, um, the, the, the wrong people when they're looking for motivation and inspiration and perhaps mm. even become obsessive about people they aspire to and make the wrong choices about who they look to. Um, is that something that, you know, you've come across and that is a natural part of, uh, the, the, of, of this conversation in terms of role models and, and how we, we go about finding them? Absolutely. I think we've, you know, I could definitely identify with times where I've looked to the wrong, to the wrong places. And as Nosy so beautifully puts, kind of she explains role models as kind of givers of hope that there is something more for you in life, be it, you know, in your personal circumstances or professional circumstances and looking to people who present 
that that is attainable for you and that they it's kind of like it's a humility that comes with that of I will I will support you and I will help you but also a taking of responsibility and I think when we look to people that are providing something of hope that actually isn't attainable for us you know that they're selling something that isn't really attainable or it's done in a way that isn't isn't coming with that humility of let me let me guide you or can I give you something that will support you towards that or or taking that respect that sense of responsibility of putting boundaries in the right places as Sophie was saying about around her social media needing those boundaries to protect herself and Nosy was saying about how she needs to look after her health as well so that she can help others so you know just leaning on those role models that aren't having don't have healthy boundaries so that things the lines just become a bit blurred or or they're not they don't have that humility to say yeah i i'm learning too i'm i'm getting it wrong don't don't put me on a pedestal let i'm learning and and come with me and learn as well so it's just it's those things isn't it that is that person taking responsibility do they have humility are they offering a hope that is actually attainable or is it a pipe dream is it something that will will kill ourselves to get and then we get there and it's just empty and it it doesn't give us what we were hoping for so yeah we all you know we all we all get caught up in the starry lights of some of the things that that we can look to we're we're kind of overwhelmed with people positioning themselves as role models but both Sophie and Nosey can acknowledge that they are role models and they didn't wake up one day and say I'm going to be a role model it's that kind of that leadership that comes really organically because people choose to put you in that position of authority and it's 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 who are those people that are taking that responsibility with humility and yeah and are we looking to those people or are we looking to the people offering that hope that isn't attainable some way maybe it is just kind of wrapped up in shiny paper but just leaves us wanting more yeah um we, we, we both of you both sophie and anna both of you have built um you know brilliant careers and then you also have this sort of very big um presence um online as well um and when it comes to digital role models you know i think people will be looking at people like you but looking at others where there is so much comparison di digitally isn't there and it's almost it's positively encouraged everyone puts this ideally idealized version of themselves forward i want to ask both of you you know sophie first you know how do you stay grounded in in that in that world and i will i will caveat this question with the fact that both of you actually i i love the fact that you're so real so in your in you know in, in what you do on your platforms it's not like you're selling an idealized view but you are surrounded by a world that's doing that so how how do you stay um level-headed and you know any lessons for, for for the rest of us well i guess anytime i do something or i post something that is sort of celebratory I do like to try and be like and here's what you can't see like everything because I know I'm an idiot like I'm an actual idiot just as much as anyone else is and I don't want to position things as you have to be perfect you have to do all these things right you have to have this you know shiny perfect life because I think that is just discouraging to people I think people feel that they can't start things because they don't have that that basic grounding that these perfect people who are doing this this stuff have and I think when it comes down to it we all know we're not perfect we all know that we have done things that we wish like the first um thing I put up on my um Instagram presuming that no one would ever see it because I had no followers it's full of typos it's got a whole duplicated slide which is an actual mess like but I really encourage people to one know that know that you don't have to have a fully formed plan of how everything's going to be perfect before you even make a start and know that everyone else is just figuring it out just as much as you are and so I try to show as much of the mess as I can mm. and just to acknowledge that that is there and has been there and that I'm trying to minimize it I'm trying to sort of 
you know do the best work that I can and do it in the most effective way that I can but especially in the digital space we are all figuring it out it's a completely new environment that we're all having to figure out how to use best and most impactfully and most authentically um and I think yeah I think just I think as I said I've always been quite um like self-contained and it doesn't really bother me if someone else thinks something bad about me or whatever so I'm just very happy to sort of put myself in my good bits and bad bits out there and just be like well this is it do you want it or no so because I'm, I'm not getting my validation from other people in that kind of way um, Anna mm. I'd be interested to hear about how you've um, balanced that yeah I think for me it's 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 similar it's about that authenticity and not trying to to sell something you know I don't want to say to people be like me this is this is what you can be like I want to say I want to help you be more like you and I will show up in my you know most of my stories I have no makeup you know I've I'm sweaty maybe I've done a little workout or I'm trying not to shout the kids and it's bringing all those different parts of you because I think no matter even you can be as honest as you want but people will still see you through their own lenses and we cannot you can't control how people see you and I think even knowing that the compliments even the nice things that people say they only see a part of you and they're seeing you through their lens so if we you know the criticism that might come my way I have to hold that in an open hand just as I have to do the positive things you know the compliments because neither of those change my my value so it's knowing actually where to look for that feedback in my life like the people that really know me the people that see me in the highs and the lows not just the 15 second snapshots on social media that actually when I'm swayed by opinion or feedback of people on social media, I have to really ground myself in that knowledge that actually who, who in my life actually deserves that authority to, to speak a word of kind of constructive criticism or to give me some kind feedback. And it's the people that know more of me, the people that see me in, in all my states. And yeah, it's just a constant reminder that social media really is just a snapshot, no matter how authentically you try and come across. We're still seeing each other through our own lenses and we can't, yeah, we can't control that. And no compliment makes you a better person. No criticism makes you any less valid and valuable. And that's, yeah, that's something that I try and hold on to amidst it all. No, I'm sure there's an element of that in your job as well about, you know, just having to be authentic and um, give a very genuine and real experience of, of, of what it's like, because I'm sure that the people that come to you, you know, are not any, under any illusions. It's, it's, a, it's a challenge, isn't it? And, um, you know, I'm sure for you it's about balancing, inspiring them, but also giving them the truth. Yeah, I, and I totally agree with so, both Sophie and, and, and Anna um, that you know, you always have to be authentic. Um, and I think what makes um, people want to really want to look up to me is the fact that I do try to keep it real. I do try to make them understand that even though they see me as this perfect being who has achieved so much, there's still so many things that mm. I probably am doing wrong and I know I am doing wrong. There's so many, there's still so many things that, or so many habits that I can unlearn. There's so many new habits that I could learn. And there's so much that I could learn from them too. Um, and I think that's what makes them relate to me. And that's because that's what made me relate to my mentor mothers as well. It was knowing that, you know, even when they had already become mentor mothers, even though I had already you know, sort of put them in a pedestal and um, thought that they were perfect beings. But knowing that there's times when one of them, one of the mental mothers I looked up to um, was actually going through an abusive relationship. And for me, I always thought of, I had before that, I had thought of mental mothers as people who would recognize the signs immediately and immediately walk out of that situation. But knowing and understanding that it was a challenge for her too, because she's human, like any one of us. Um, and that it took, it took a whole lot of might from her to be able to walk out of that situation. Um, and that she's a human 
um, that met what made her relatable to me too. Thank you. I just want to finish up, Nosy, by just asking you a little bit about the past year and your work in South Africa, um, given that we are dealing with two pandemics or our epidemics and um, that, you know, you have been facing the, the extra COVID threat alongside this incredible uh, fight that you've been, you've been on, you know, since you first joined Mothers to Mothers. What extra challenges are the women that you're meeting at the moment facing as a result of COVID this year? I think one of the greatest challenges um, is actually quite similar to when we, um, when HIV started, um, that there was a lot of misinformation around um, COVID-19. And so people needed to, needed people was, who were going to bring them information, who were going to bring them the truth about, um, about the pandemic. Um, but one of the greatest challenges that we faced was that as the healthcare systems started to work towards um, ensuring that people got tested for COVID, that they got treated for COVID, we stood the risk of actually leaving behind people who are living with other chronic illnesses such as HIV because of how stretched the healthcare systems are and the focus that was now put on COVID, there was less focus being put on ensuring that people living with HIV got on treatment and are kept on treatment. And so it was vital for us as mothers to mothers and mental mothers to ensure that, you know, our clients know or remember the importance of going to the clinic for care, remember the importance of going to the clinic despite all the fear of being infected with COVID to go and get their antiretroviral medicines. And plus, we also had to rethink how we give services to women. Previously, would be easily be able to go door to door um, into households in the community to educate, to give health education to people. COVID changed all of that. So we had to rethink how do we still reach um, our, the people that we need to reach in the community. And so Mothers to Mothers introduced what we call e-services where we follow up with our clients by phone or text messages. We also built a new platform on WhatsApp called the Virtual Mentor Mother where people can go on to access vital health information that's going to help them stay on treatment. Um, yeah, so there were a whole lot of challenges. And so, and I think had we not taken those steps, we would have done exactly what you and AIDS feared. We would have turned back the clock on HIV. We, have, we would have lost so many more lives had we not rethought how we keep people engage and keep people within the healthcare systems. Thank you very much, Nosy. Keep up the good work. It's uh, fantastic what you're doing. Um, I am going to finish it there, but ask if anybody has any questions because we're going to go open it up for questions to the panelists now. Do you, oh. Um, anyone can answer this one. What three values do you strive to live by and why as a role model? Does anyone want to jump in and do that one? Maybe what's, what three values are important for a role model? I, th I think for me, it's, accountability having making sure that there are people that I'm accountable to people that I'm talking to people that I'm more honest and open with than than I might be when I'm kind of working publicly so it's that accountability people that can ask you those difficult questions um humility 
I'm naturally quite defensive. So I find it, you know, I really have to try and just work on that humility when I might get criticism or challenge to actually look at that and think, is there something in that? Is there something that maybe I need to address that maybe I need to change it? It's that, it's that being, being willing to be challenged that Nosy was talking about, you know, it's that willingness to be, to be challenged and to learn from other people, even when sometimes you think you know, you know it, that actually we don't, we don't. <laughs> and sometimes we need to learn from other people and authenticity. Yeah, not not fearing the the different parts of yourself. So addressing those areas of shame that we often have around certain parts of our personality because that keeps us stuck. So just yeah, trying to be authentic. Um, one for Sophie. Do you think that a role model necessarily needs to share your background and experience to be able to inspire you? No, I don't think so. I think so long. I think we're often taught that um, people have to be similar to us to be relatable to us, and we see that so much with things like you know the conversation around the Sainsbury's advert that's come out this year with people saying you know I can't relate to this like. You absolutely can. You can relate to an advert about a carrot. You can relate to that. You can relate to an advert featuring black people. Like, I think so long as there is something there that speaks to you, whatever that is, I don't think it matters that you are from the same place or the same age or the same race or have the same gender identity. I, because I don't think anyone's going to tell you who your role models need to be. If there is someone who speaks to you, who makes you want to do better, who inspires you, then... I think that's all you need. We don't need to quantify it in terms of um, similarities or dissimilarities to us. Um, another one for Anna. What can, what can we do about the fall of a role model? Um, somebody that we aspire to that does something that is a bit disappointing because you know they're basically human after all. Um, what, 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 what can we do about that? <laughs> I think it's a it's, it is a loss in a way um, because you know we when we look up to someone and then they 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 may do something or get something wrong that that it's in a way it's a loss of that kind of that ideal and and it might be that we've kind of gone a bit too far in the idealizing of that person and not left space for their humanness and that's a reminder for us to ensure that we are leaving space for our humanness and when we're looking to grow and change and develop. Are we, are we being gracious to ourselves? Are we being compassionate to ourselves? Are we leaving space for us to get it wrong so that when other people get it wrong, that it's, you know, that criticism isn't the first thing that comes to mind. And it's, yeah, it's just acknowledging when, when, why, when might we be kind of idealizing someone? Because idealizing and idealizing someone is very, is, is kind of verging on, you know, it's different, isn't it? It's that, I'm trying to aspire to be like that person when actually, you know, what about who I am? What's what's wrong with who I am? What's wrong with just trying to nurture and develop who I am? Um, so just, yeah, to be aware of when we're putting people a little bit too high up on that pedestal and perhaps giving them the opportunity to fall because we all fall, we all fall. Um, Nosy, one for you. What do your, what do your kids, what, what do your children think about um, what you do? And do you have any messages that you try to pass on to your daughters? Um, well, my daughters are quite young. Um, and so I think from, for, for now, um, I'm the perfect mom to them. <laughs> um, and per, probably they think of me as always right. Um, but I think, you know, I have so many other girls um, in the family who also have said that they look up to me um, and one of the things that they have said that they look up, that make them want to look up to me, to me is how I have managed to overcome so many challenges that were stacked against me growing up, um, challenges that they have not had to face because they have people like me to sort of shield them. Um, so yeah. I think that's what makes um, other young girls in the family look up to me. And if there was one message that I would um, share with um, young adolescent girls and young women was, is that, you know, as you look up to a person, 
do not try to become them. Just try to pick whatever it is about them that makes you want to become a better you. Hmm. Yeah, and that will be it. Thank you. That seems like a, a pretty fantastic point to, to, to finish on. Um, I'm going to hand back to Emma now, um, who will take over. And thank you very much, everybody, uh, for joining us today for this really um, enlightening conversation. And thank you very much to our panellists. That was brilliant. Thank you so much to Andrea and to all of our panellists. Um, I hope you can all see why we think that Nosy needs her own YouTube panel now. <laughs> I mentioned at the top of this um, meeting that today is World AIDS Day, but it's not just World AIDS Day. It also happens to be Giving Tuesday, um, one of the charming American traditions that we are very, very, very happy to adopt uh, globally a day of global giving when everyone everywhere can support the causes that are close to their heart. So if like me, you've been inspired by this heartwarming, hopeful conversation, here are a couple of ways that you can get involved and support Mothers to Mothers. The obvious, you could make a donation as part of the She's Got the Power campaign, all donations made will be doubled by a generous group of supporters. So for every pound that you donate or dollar for our US listeners, your impact on the ground will be doubled and you should see a link in the chat function shortly. We'd also love you to post a picture of your role model on social media using the hashtag she's got the power. It could be your mama, it could be your sister, it could be your friend. We've had quite a lot of uh, Jacinda Ardern, I have absolutely no idea why, um, but think, think about your role model and post with the She's Got the Power tag and um, at Mothers to Mothers so that we can reshare. And obviously follow us on all of our channels, whether it's Instagram at Mothers to Mothers or on Facebook at Mothers to Mothers International or at, on Twitter at M2M Tweets. Really, there's just time for one more final thank you to each of you for joining us, to Andrea, to the team at Marie Claire for their tremendous support and to Angela who supports us um, in the wings at Marie Claire um, and to all of them as partners of Mothers to Mothers and to Sophie, to Anna, to Nosy for your profound and kind and intelligent comments um, this afternoon. So thank you all.